Welcome everybody out there here to our next webinar here at uh, JFT Bank. And a warm well welcome in the name of JFT Bank and uh, from my end as well. My name is Stefan Frodichowski. As always, for those uh, webinars today, it's the 23rd of January 2020. And uh, since it's the first uh, webinar this year as uh, JFT Power Webinar, I think it's still a good time to say all the best for the year 2020. Okay. T today we have a totally different topic. Value at risk, an underestimated key figure. So honestly, we do not really talk about trading strategy. Although value at risk might be even a good indicator or complete trading strategy. And later you will learn that there is a German company um, now 1 billion euro uh, total value, which is more or less completely based on that value. Well, you were with that it something out of that key figure and got really quite good resonance in the market as invest for investors. So uh, let's talk about that as well. So it's a key figure, normally just for an investment, but we can even answer questions like, what you should prefer, an investment in S&P 500 or maybe the DAX? Okay, you may have a look to the chart. That's always uh, one answer to uh, such a question, but to have an objective key figure, that's a good idea. And value at risk, as the name is already telling us, um, is a key figure which is which emphasizes more the risk side of a trade. And honestly, that's always good because just looking to returns might be misleading and might be a disaster in the final end. Okay, but all this is really part of today's uh, webinar and it looks that we are once again here quite international as at least if I guess from the names here but uh, that's maybe totally wrong just uh, looking to the names. You know the procedure before I really start as always I have to show up the risk disclaimer because we talk about trading, we talk about trading strategies, we talk about investments but all you do finally, you do it on your own, on your own responsibility. I think that's quite self-explaining, <clears throat> but it has to be mentioned during any webinar at least once. So let's start. So the today's topic um, can be divided into the following parts. So first of all, I want to introduce you in some more key figures at all for investments, trading strategies. If you have two different strategies and you want to compare them, um, then we need objective criteria for that. Therefore, let's have a brief overview about other key figures. And of course, value of risk will be one of those and um, that one we will really dive into. Of course, we need to know the definition of value at risk. And uh, it might look on the first hand really complicated. Normally you talk about histograms and, and quantils and uh, stuff like that, which really sounds uh, like a disaster. No, uh, practically doing it with real values, it's really quite easy, you will see. So we talk about the field of use for value at risk and we will show, I will show you some examples. Um, I will start with the Dow Jones, uh, with a real long history, more than 100 years. And uh, then, of course, I want to answer that question from the beginning. What is a better investment in terms of value at risk, DAX or S&P 500? And maybe if you have still some time, uh, you might even uh, tell me some stock company names and I will do a comparison with two of them just to answer once again the question, what might be the better investment? So that is the underlying 
question. So if it comes to investment, we need key figures in order to compare those investments. And if I talk about investments, I indeed mean trading strategies as well. So we might have a track record of an account or we might have a back tested um, trading strategy, something like that. And now the question is, which one is better? And therefore we need key figures. Of course, any key figure does not tell you something real about the future. It's impossible. It would be nice to have that, but to have any any guarantee for future behavior of whatever investment, simply we don't know, but at least we can compare the history. And the most often used key, key figures are first-hand return yield. So however you name it, just looking to the return and you can, you might do it on a monthly base or on a yearly base, or you have a single key figure just like uh, since inception, especially if we talk about um, bonds or if we talk about ETFs or something like that, then you have always this since inception. Um, but better is to do analysis on a on a shorter time period, like monthly or yearly, and then you get a return. Okay, and I think you are it's the first time here in my webinars. Of course, return is not everything, and okay, high return is always nice, and normally you would not invest invest into something uh, which has a negative return. It's just one key figure. But funny enough, there are a lot of people investing money in um, in fonts or similar to fonts uh, which have negative return. And that is uh, if you buy bonds from the, uh, for example, German state, hmm? uh, you get a negative yield. And uh, yeah, funny enough, there are a lot of people buying that. They have their reasons to do that. Um, but they buy even something with a negative return. But when we talk about trading, normally we would not go for something like that. Next, the return, of course, it's always to, to have a view on the risk side as well. And the one key figure for, for showing up the risk is just looking for the maximum drawdown, which is historically from one high, high point or one high value, one maximum within the equity curve to the deepest down afterwards, uh, percentage wise, which is exactly the maximum drawdown. That's an important key figure as well, because it shows at least for the history, the absolute worst case, which has happened in the past. So yes, important key figure. And now, since we talk about return and we talk about drawdowns, best is to compare those two. And then what you normally do is you divide return by risk or return divided by drawdown. Uh, then you have a quotient, which is not that bad key figure. Um, and if you follow up my webinars here uh, since the very beginning, sometimes I, when I talk about trading strategies, I have my own key figure, which is called opti or prof, profit vector. Uh, even it's uh, spelled here in German, but anyhow, uh, then you know, it's more or less the same than return divided by risk. It's just uh, the other way around, uh, drawdown divided by return. And in this case, it's not, uh, you don't use a return, I just use the slope of the equity, but uh, it's more or less something quite similar. And uh, the first you want to maximize, the other you want to minimize, but that's uh, only uh, mathematics and uh, no real new information. So that is good to always compare return and risk. So that is good for any investment. There's another one which is quite um, common and uh, widely used uh, that is called the so-called sharp ratio and even if the definition sounds a little bit complicated, practically that uh, to calculate sharp ratio, it's not a big deal. Um, sharp ratio is defined by the quotient of uh, average excess return 
divided by the standard deviation of the return. So let's think about, uh, we have returns on a monthly base. Um, then, of course, you can calculate the standard deviation of that return. Uh, that's not a big deal. But what is meant with excess return? That's quite easy. Um, normally, in normal times, we have um, some not high, but some interest rates just on money. Uh, today was uh, EZB um, interest rate decision. Uh, they keep it at more or less a zero. So everything above zero is already in excess. <laughs> so um, just the average return divided by standard deviation of the return would be in uh, nowadays uh, would be exactly the sharp ratio. The good thing about sharp ratio, sharp ratio is that you have a comparison. Um, in a way, average return is okay. Um, and what would be ideal? Ideal would be to have constantly, for example, a monthly return of 1%. And if that would be really constantly, then the standard deviation would be zero. Um, and then uh, we have a very high quotient. Uh, in this case, it would be infinity, but anyhow. So to don't, but, but think about normal trading strategies. Of course, you don't have constant uh, return uh, every month. It would be good, but uh, it's just a dream. So you would have a standard deviation, uh, not equal zero. And then yeah, you uh, can calculate the sharp ratio. Not that bad. Uh, definition and more or less, uh, if you comes to portfolios and you think about um, the Markowitz portfolios, then that is more or less the definition how he is creating portfolios or comparing investments. But now you see there's another one, value at risk, and value at risk emphasizes the risk side. Which still we can uh, look for the return and the average returns uh, as well. But now we do it completely different. And uh, I quote here just uh, Wikipedia for the definition of value of risk. Value at risk is a measure of the risk of loss for investments. It estimates how much a set of investment might lose with a given probability, given normal market condition in a set time period, such as a day, months, or year. So you get already a glimpse on, on value at risk. So it's try to estimate how much and how often you might lose a certain amount of money. That's good. If you have a view on, on the risk side and the potential losses of any investment. And therefore, I really like value at risk as being a quite good key figure. But now it comes to the definition of value at risk. And in principle, the value at risk is based on three, let's call them parameters. Like um, normally we have, for example, an EMA, then there's one parameter of the EMA, which is the period. And in this case, we have so uh, let's call them three parameters, or at least we need definitions. And the first one is simply the return time. So on what Base we are looking. Are we looking for daily returns, monthly returns, yearly returns? It's similar to sharp ratio, where you have to, uh, to know of, on what, what time, let's call it period, uh, we are looking. And uh, of course, my favorites are monthly and yearly. Uh, daily is uh, for investment, maybe that we could use as it well, but anyhow. But now there's, it looks really uh, bad. I mean, now we. Yeah really diving into deep mathematics. We're talking about so-called quantils, um, but it's not a nightmare. It's quite easy. I will give you an example. And that is more or less a threshold. And typically that threshold is uh, given as 1%, 5%. And um, you don't have to be disappointed right now. Practically, it's much more easy, uh, much easier than uh, the example I show you now from the Wikipedia side, uh, website, uh, there's a good article and this has a good picture and I use that picture. Normally, when we talk about value at risk, you would show up um, and with a histogram of your returns. 
maybe daily, maybe monthly, yearly returns. And then you get, um, you can create a histogram, which means you have the probability for a given return. And here in this picture, you would see, okay, the highest probability for, um, um, you can find is for 1% return. And if you um, look for even higher returns, then the probability goes down. And if you go uh, to negative returns, it goes down as well. But you have um, uh, numbers here for negative returns as well. And now, what is meant with the 1% or 5% quantile? It's exactly that threshold when that area has a percentage um, value of the total area. And for example, if you look for the 5% uh, quantile, it would be exactly that red area. And now the value at risk for that histogram, that probability distribution would be minus 8. Hey, that's now the value at risk. But what does it mean? We'll come to that. And uh, the good thing is when you um, try to, to get value at risks for your investments, your values of interest, um, stocks, uh, indices, um, investments, it's easier to calculate than you might think. And we will do it practically. So, but first, the third parameter um, we, we have to look for is we have to define on what time period in total we are looking for those returns. So the considered time is of interest as well. So what you can do, of course, is you can do it since inception. And for Dow Jones, we will do it since 18. Uh, 96 in this case. Um, so, of course, you can always start with the inception date for any investment, uh, and you have historical data for that. But you can go for a smaller time frame as well. So, you can just look back maybe five years because you might think, what's even more um, in the past? I don't care anymore. So, that is the third parameter you need. The result is as it's always a loss percentage. So like in uh, the Wikipedia uh, website, it was minus 8.2. So that was a value at risk, minus 8.2 in this case. But what does it mean? And now it's really quite easy. Let's do a practical example here. If we set that quantile to 5% and now, because Quantil is really, um, yeah, I think not that well known. Think about what what does it mean? Five percent. Five percent means one divided by twenty, which equals exactly 0 0.05, so five percent. Because now it is much easier. And think we are doing a looking for a yearly consideration. And now, if your value at risk six percent, better it would. Be, uh, to say it's uh, minus 6%, but anyhow. So a value of risk of 6% can be interpreted as that every 20 years, you might have a, a yearly loss exceeding the 6%, so uh, even higher, so minus 7 or something like that, minus 6.5, every 20 years. And now you see the translation of that um, strange quantile is quite easy. If we set the level at 5%, it's every 20. And if we are looking for the year, if we are looking for a yearly consideration, it's every 20 years. If our base would be a monthly consideration, it would be every 20 months, 20 months. So if we have such a value, value at risk of 6%, so every 20 year, we might expect losses higher than that. Okay, but that is good to know something like that, because then it will set up our mind about any investment. And even better, we can now compare different um, assets, different investments, exactly with that kind of key figure. And that's 
really good that we can do it. And it's always based on the risk. And that is sometimes even more important than the return, because the risk is the one which might ruin our investment um, to have less return, at least will not ruin you. Therefore, to be always risk oriented is better than to be too much on the return side. I hope that is already a good understanding. And when we do it practically just here in Excel, or in my case, LibreOffice, uh, it will be uh, quite easy. I will show up you some examples, but now I mentioned something that based on value at risk, there's a complete company which is really based on that kind of principle. And um, you might even know that company, they, they offer investments. Uh, so you can say, I have 5,000 euros and I want to invest. And I want the company to create a portfolio of ETFs with a given value at risk. That is the number you are telling that company. And maybe you say, okay, 10%, that's my value. So it might be that every 20 years, because they are using the 5% quantile, every 20 years, I have a loss exceeding 10% and then 5%. And then that company is creating an ETF portfolio and um, your money will be invested. And the company's name is Scalable. The German company Scalable, and now uh, the company is worth more than a billion. Oh, not that bad. And everything, honestly, is based on value at risk. Um, they even write it down. Uh, if you go to the website and really scroll to the very end, then you can download a so-called white paper and they explain how they are doing all the calculations. It's an interesting paper. It's for us to read. Um, so I can only recommend that. So value at risk, an underestimated key figure. I would say if you can build up a company uh, with more than a billion exactly on that key figure, very nice. So my examples here, and I will really do it practically, I will start with the Dow Jones and I will really use the complete history because I have the history or you as well, because I show you where to get it. Uh, since more than 100 years, well, we have numbers for the uh, Dow Jones and uh, we can do it on a monthly and on a yearly basis. I will do both. Um, and then it will be quite obvious how to calculate a value at risk practically and how you can do it really by your own. Then I will do a comparison between DAX and S&P 500. And if you like, we can look for some stock companies, um, then just mention uh, some names here in the chat, and uh, we will do a comparison between those, those stock companies just based on value at risk. Okay, finally, I mentioned here already what it means in general when we talk about value at risk. It's quite objective key figure and it really enables us to compare different kind of investments. There's a disadvantage uh, because we have no number for the potential loss, which we might have every 20 years, but there's an alternative and I will introduce that as well. And the alternative is a so-called expected shortfall. It's really easy to uh, use that as well. But now let's really start, and um, starting means we first need data. And um, since we go for daily data, um, I will use the website, which is called um, stock.com. Um, and if you see the name, uh, uh, once again, it's really uh, nice written. It's uh, S T W O Q. So not the English stock, uh, but it's a, a Polish website, and I assume that is a, a Polish um, word for stocks. Anyhow, and here you can find really uh, thousands of investment, and I will go for the Dow Jones, um, so you can download almost anything here. And in this case, the data started at uh, 1896, which is really nice. Um, and then we can simply download those data. 
um, that should be done in a few seconds. And after we have downloaded the data, we can uh, import those data into Excel. For me, it's just a double click. Uh, and I use not Excel, I use um, LibreOffice. And here we have the data. Good. Let me enlarge my screen a little bit here. Uh, good. So volume, we don't care. I delete. Um, and we would really like to see the, the date. Um, honestly, the data uh, start with uh, not really open, high, low, close, uh, just close prices. Anyhow, uh, for statistical uh, considerations here, it's uh, fair enough to have uh, those close price data. And further down the time, uh, then they are really open, high, low, close, as you can see. And there's another drawdown, the uh, drawback here within the data. In 1914, there's a gap for 100 days, but I don't care about that. But it's nice to, to have a long history because then we have more statistics here. So first, what we have to, to calculate is a return. And now I want to go for monthly return. Let's start with that. So. Our first data point is the 27th of May. Then I look for the next um, 20, yeah, 7, 27 doesn't exist. It's weekend. Uh, anyhow, then I go for the 26th. And I want to keep it really simple. So what I just calculate is the percentage return um, based or if you would have started your investment on the 27th of May, then one month later, you would have earned or you would have lose that amount uh, of money. And in this case, that um, would be a loss, but anyhow. So you see, we have just a monthly uh, return now here. And I simply go with uh, that number down the table here. So then we have all the returns, all the monthly returns uh, calculated. Whether that is always exactly one month or because of the weekend, one or extra day or one day less, I don't care. It's, uh, it it's doesn't really change uh, the overall picture. And all the numbers above, I fill with zeros because we don't have data there. It's tricky and easy part. Uh, easy part now to calculate the value at risk for Dow Jones on a monthly base. We just take the two uh, columns, we copy them, and we open a new sheet, and we insert those numbers, but not by um, Control V. No, we need a special insert because I don't. I only want to insert the numbers and the formats. Otherwise, uh, we would have we would have here an equation, um, and uh, that would be not any more um, uh, right. And now we have a simple table with uh, date and return, and all we have to do is we have to sort them um, discounting. We can have a look for that. Um, so. We have the highest return now on top here uh, and the lowest return at the bottom. And it would look like this one here. And that is always something I call, and you know that, a pseudo histogram, because we can use that in order to get directly the 5% uh, and the 95% quantile. Um, that's now no problem. You see, because they are ordered um, descending, uh, so we, say we have had the highest returns, 1932, with exceeding 50%, but you know what has been a couple of years before. And if I jump to the, uh, to the other side, and you see that we have 32,000 uh, data points here, uh, we have even losses of minus 40% within one month. Uh, and that has been 1929. Uh, of course, you know, deep depression. Um, 
Okay, you may think, let's find the history. Okay, let's go a little bit upwards. Now, here, just one page upwards, 2008. It's quite high in the oil hit list, or better to say quite low, uh, down in the hit list. And then we have had a monthly loss of 25%. Wow, that's not a slow, uh, a small number. And you see other months have been here around with 25% as well. Okay, that is our return. And now let's go for value at risk. We 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 mind ourselves to the number of rows. We have 32,052 and that's the number we need. 3252, uh, 51 entries. So that's the number of data points we have. And now it's really easy to get the 5% value and the 95% value. All we need is we need to look in the right row. And that's all. So we need, on the one hand side, we need the row with the number 1206. That would be the upwards potential of our value at risk. That is not a number which is commonly used, but uh, we will look for that as well. And we need that value, 95% uh, of here. That is the column 30,485. And now it's really easy to get the value at risk. Let me change the order. So. No, ah, it's anyhow. Um, all I have to do is I now go to the cell B1603, and here for the cell 30,449. Oops, to that cell. And that's all. What do you have here? Is the value at risk with a 5% quantile? Isn't that easy? Isn't that easy? That's a calculation. Now we know that the value of risk of an investment in Dow Jones is minus 8%. Or in other words, because we are looking to a monthly table here, um, every 20 months we might expect a loss of 8%. And it's really that easy to calculate the value at risk. You don't need a real histogram or something like that. No, uh, it's really easy. That is all we have to do. And um, we can even do a little bit more. So the other one we might uh, be interested in is simply the average. and that is from here to the very end. And that is 0.6%. So if an investment in Dow Jones historically gave us 0.6% as a monthly return. And if you translate that to a yearly return, that would be, uh, you can just uh, multiply it with 12. Uh, so it would be times 10, 6, uh, 7, 7 point something uh, percent. For small numbers, um, it's okay if you just multiply it with uh, 12. Uh, I know the real calculation is a little bit different, but uh, for numbers not too far away from zero, uh, it's okay to do it that way. So we can get the average return as well. And finally, I mentioned already a disadvantage of um, value at risk. And one solution is to go for the expected uh, shortfall. That's the name of that key figure. And to calculate that is once again quite easy. It's simply the average of all the losses behind the value at risk. So 
it would be the cells B, 30,449, 449 until uh, the very end. Since I don't know it, I just go for that value. And that is the so-called expected shortfall. It's simply the average of all the losses behind uh, or below the value at risk. So we can measure now the value at risk of a given investment. And it's really straightforward, and quite easy. In this case, we have 8% on a monthly base and we have um, an average of 0.6%. To do the same thing now for, um, there was Dow Jones on a monthly base, to do the same uh, okay. Once again, I want to save it. Now I got it. So, um, and now I want to, to change everything so that we have a yearly consideration. So I'll save it once again. So then I have both as final end, uh, how to do it yearly. It's quite easy. Okay, that was a little bit misspelling, but anyhow, all we have to do is we change our calculation of the return. So, 27 May, and now we simply go for the next 27 May, which is here. Okay, so we only have to change um, the numbers here. And the cell E2 is uh, the top cell after the title. And we have now the yearly return. And all above, I go for zeros. And now we do the same step as before. We take those two columns, insert them here. It's not done. Oh, still calculating. And um, so we we insert the numbers. So my fault has been uh, first always delete uh, the picture because um, then it takes such much time here. Uh, so unfortunately, I forgot to delete the graph first and therefore I have long time and long running times here and if you remember all we have to do is we have to sort the data um, descending and here we go and now we have the value at risk on a yearly base and the value at risk is uh, let's call it 25 percent so interpretation Every 20 years, we might have a drawdown or a loss of 25% every 20 years. And the number every 20 years stems from this 5% because that is one divided by 20. That's the logic behind. And you see the average yearly return is indeed 7.5%. So my estimation was not that bad, but still an investment in Dow Jones might create a loss every 20 years exceeding 25%, which is the definition of where you're at risk and the expected short -term fall here in this case um, would be 35%. And to make the story complete, the other one here is a 95% value um, interpretation. Once again, quite easy. Every 20 years, we might have profits exceeding 40%. So that's the upside of any return in Dow Jones. But that's how it's running and how you can calculate the value at risk even by your own. So what I mentioned else is that I want to show you um, 
the comparison of DAX and S&P 500, but that is now not done uh, manually. Uh, I have uh, prepared that already. And in this case, I um, look for data since 2000. And I look for data um, on a monthly return, for a monthly return that was the calculation here. And the reason to do that kind of investigation between DAX and S&P 500 is simple, the question, what might be the better investment? An investment into DAX, you may think about for the DAX itself, or you may buy it, an ETF on DAX, or same for S&P 500. And we can answer now that question. How? Let's look for the value at risk. And um, so here we have the value at risk, starting once again here uh, with the with historical price data, calculating the monthly return, and then doing the same here uh, with our extra sheet. And answer is value at risk close to 10%, average return 0.45, expected shortfall is given here as well. And that are the numbers for the DAX. And now let's have a view on uh, S&P 500 as well. And I shift everything here, then I have them close to each other. And now we can look for the same kind of numbers for the S&P 500. And what do we realize? Uh, the, the value at risk for the S&P 500 is minus 7.5%. So the S&P 500 has a lower value at risk. So it's not that risky to invest into the S&P 500. And happily, and that's really, um, that's not a mistake. The average return starting from uh, year 2000 is the same for both. But that is, uh, when I saw that first, I, uh, I thought maybe maybe that's uh, uh, I did something wrong with the calculation here, um, but now if we go for three digits, uh, you will see that those two numbers are not exactly the same. So it's just by chance that they are close to each other. But in this case, since the average return is the same more or less for both, but the S and P five hundred has a less value at risk, then I think the answer, which kind of investment is a better one, is really quite easy. So that's the way how you can use the value at risk as a key figure to compare two investments. And now let's do it for other things. You might have uh, your watch list like stocks, or you might think about fonts, or you might have a trading strategy and you want to compare that with the risk behavior of S&P 500 or the risk behavior of the DAX. Everything is valid and everything is possible with a key figure a value at risk. And um, yeah, I have already two from yesterday's webinar to stock companies which have been named uh, to be investigated and one has been Apple and uh, the other has been Deutsche Telekom and so that is Apple and here we have Deutsche Telekom okay let's move the Deutsche Telekom here and let's have this one here And I did this just for five years backwards. So I started with the data from 2015 and same logic, everything just downloading the data, uh, calculating the return um, on a monthly basis. In this case, uh, copy paste those into a new sheet, uh, sort them, descending and then looking for the number of data we have, then we know where to look for the value at risk. And here we go. Here's the answer. 
Apple has a value at risk on a 5% quantile on a monthly base with close to 30%. Quite risky. On the other hand, Deutsche Telekom, um, you may know that company, maybe not, anyhow. Uh, it's not that uh, bad if you don't know that. In, um, but anyhow, value at risk of Deutsche Telekom is less, 8%. So if we just look for what kind of investment is more risky, of course, it's Apple. But if we put another thing into our consideration, you know, the average return, then for Apple, the monthly average return for the uh, last five years on a monthly basis, 2%, whoops, every month you would have earned 2% um, yield. That's not that bad. That's exceeding the 25% per year. So high returns on that um, stock company. And on the other hand, looking for Deutsche Telekom, Oops, a 0.15, okay, times 12 would be point, uh, not that bad, two, three percent, okay, that's not that much. So we, of course, we have much, as we have less risk, but more or less no return. The good thing is we have a key figure in order to look for the returns. We have other key figures to look for the uh, for, for the risk, the one that was value at risk, and the other, just for example, the average return. And that's really cool to have in numbers like that, answering the question of risk and answering the question of returns. And to have both is even better. And that should be, could be a base for your investments decisions as well. And by the way, we have already introduced the expected shortfall as being another key figure, um, which is quite good to be used. So now, that's a story about uh, value at risk, and you might use that key figure, and you can really do the calculations by your own. It's not a big deal, and if you have interest in those Excel sheets we have had here with uh, in the webinar, just drop me a line to s.friedrichowski at jfdbank.com and I will uh, forward those Excel sheets to you as well. But my summary here, today's nutshell, yeah, well, your address is really an interesting and a well-suited key figure for any evaluation of investments. And there's even a big company called Scalable, which is based on that key figure in order to create portfolios, customized, really customized for the risk level, the customized setting. So that is uh, quite cool. The value at risk emphasizes really the risk consideration, which is really good when we look for investments that we have always a, a good look on the risk side and not only on returns. And it offers us the possibility really to compare different investment, different investment products, different trading strategies on the risk side and on the return side with all the other key figures we have in mind. That's the story about value at risk. I hope you find even uh, that webinar once again quite interesting. At least I hope so. And uh, for me, yeah, I have a good time for today, the rest of the day, and enjoy well, the weekend is a little bit too early. We have the Friday in front of us. So happy Friday is there. And uh, for you, all the best. See you again and have a good time. Bye-bye.